So welcome to the maiden voyage of Zoom meeting for history class 2021. And um, I'm thrilled to see your faces again. It's been it's been almost a year since I've seen some of you. And um, I've missed every single one of you. And thank you for all of you who have watched the YouTube presentations and also have asked questions or emailed me with little encouragements. And I just appreciate it all. And um, hopefully one day, once again, we'll be able to be together and drink tea. Um, as it is 19th century history class, I thought we would start with the Lord's mm -hmm. Prayer, if sure. you all would join me. Our Father, Father who art in heaven, heaven. hallowed be thy name. Be thy name. Thy kingdom thy come, kingdom come. Thy will be done, be done on earth as it is in heaven. Is in heaven. Give us this day our daily, day bread, our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. us. And lead us not into temptation, temptation, but deliver us from evil. From evil. For thine is the kingdom, the, kingdom, the power, power, and the glory, glory for an ever and ever. Amen. Amen. So thank you. Um, I want to thank a couple of people first um, who helped me. One, my daughter, little Adelaide, got me, <laughs> sent me to Zoom school and got it all sorted out. Um, I thank also you. want to thank Betsy West again for being so great in getting us, keeping us connected email wise. And also Chrissy Wade, I don't see Chrissy on the screen, but um, she apparently is a real Zoom expert and she walked me through the whole share, share screen scenario. So thanks to all of you, but mostly thank you to Shepard um, oh. and Matt Thornton Kennedy, our speaker a number of times through the Ansley's, but I never had a cell phone number for obvious reasons. So I called Shepard and I said, would you mind sharing that number with me? I want to invite uh, Thornton to be our speaker. And he did. So Thornton blamed him for all this extra work. Um, well, after, just, after Thornton does his presentation and we have follow-up questions and so on, um, I'd let him, Thornton, I'm gonna let you jump off. Um, and then we've just got a few little announcements to make about what's coming up. And then um, I'd like to talk to you about a couple other things. So um, with that, I would love to introduce Thornton Kennedy, if if I may. Um, and he has a wonderful CV and I'm just gonna actually read it because I couldn't improve on it, Thornton. For a decade now, Thornton Kennedy has written a weekly column in the North Side Neighbor. His topics are usually related to local history or his family, which has been in the Buckhead community for four generations on both his mother's and his father's sides. He can trace both back six generations in Atlanta. He was an editor with the Marietta Daily Journal, The Neighbor, and the Atlanta Business Chronicle for several years before he launched his own public relations firm, PR South, in 2010. His clients include Dorsey Alston Realtors, Smith & Howard Certified Public Accountants, and the Novair Group. He is civically active, having served on the executive committee of the Atlanta Humane Society, the Georgia Board of the Trust for Public Land, and the Board of Buckhead Heritage Society. He is currently the secretary of the Kiwanis Club of Atlanta and serves on the boards of the Atlanta Preservation Center and the Atlanta Musical Music Festival Association. He and his wife, Lori, live in Buckhead. Their daughter, Virginia, is a junior at North Atlanta High School and their son, Thornton III, is a freshman at the University of Maryland. <clears throat> Most weekends, you can find them hiking along the Chattahoochee River on land that has been in his family for several generations before becoming part of the National Recreation Area or on the Atlanta Beltline with their rescue dogs, Millie and Margaret. Um, Thornton, we're just delighted to have you. And um, you have the screen, you have whatever time you need, and we're just delighted to hear your presentation on famous couples in Atlanta. Ha, I, I was muted. Uh, thank you guys so much for uh, uh, inviting me to speak. Uh, when Adelaide called and offered me this opportunity, I jumped at it because I'm always uh, very flattered and humbled that A, people read uh, my column and uh, B, that people would invite me to, uh, to speak. I just, I think it's, uh, it's awesome and I'm glad to be here. And I love to share some of the history that I've learned over the years uh, with folks. Uh, as Adelaide said, I've been writing these columns for 10 years now. 
And uh, the way I kind of got started on it is through my own family. I graduated from college. I came back to Atlanta and uh, I got involved with the Atlanta History Center and a couple of other things. And I read a book, it was called The Bonfire by a guy named Mark Wartman. And in The Bonfire, I'm reading this book and suddenly there's my great, great, great grandfather, Alfred Austell. And uh, I just, it was <laughs> shocking to me that he was uh, made this appearance in this book and he was most famous perhaps, he's in the book quite a few times, but he rode out with Mayor James Calhoun under a white flag and surrendered the city of Atlanta uh, during the Civil War. Now, I grew up hearing stories about Alfred Austell. My father's favorite thing to do with us when we were little was take us to Oakland Cemetery and have a picnic next to the Austell Mausoleum. And uh, this was the 1970s, the 1980s, when that area was really not nearly as nice as it is today. It was, uh, and Oakland was not nearly in the shape it is today. So it was a little weird to go down there. Uh, but I heard all these family stories, not only from my dad's side, but from my mother's side as well. My mother's uh, family went back to the Adairs and the Howells, mm -hmm. and they were here mm -hmm. before Atlanta was Atlanta as well. Uh, so it's just fascinating to me. So I started doing some family research and finding all these stories that I found incredibly interesting. So when I had the opportunity to have my own column, uh, the first thing I did is I started writing about my own family history because I thought it was so interesting. Uh, but pretty quickly, I got a couple people pull me aside and they said, you know, our family's been here for a long time too. So I, <laughs> I figured out that I needed to broaden my horizons a little bit and, and tell uh, the, the fuller story of Atlanta. So today what I'm gonna do, uh, I've got a presentation that walks through what I think is an interesting take on Atlanta history. And I'm gonna talk about some couples. And the interesting thing here with y'all's theme this year is it gives me an opportunity to talk about some people that don't, I, I don't get to, to talk about a lot. A lot of Atlanta history is hung on the men. Uh, it's all males. Uh, and there are a lot of women that contributed a great deal uh, and yet they kind of, they don't get as much uh, attention. So with that, I'm going to share my screen here and we'll start. So what, I'm, what we're going to do is we're going to start with where, where Atlanta started. Now, the, the important thing to remember is that in 1776, when our nation declared independence and we fought the Revolutionary War and won our independence, Buckhead, Atlanta, where you're sitting now, if you're in Atlanta, was not in the United States. Where you are now was Indian territory. <clears throat> Buckhead was on the edge of two nations. So if you were on the south side of the Chattahoochee River, you were in the Muscogee Nation. If you were on to the north side of the Chattahoochee River, you were in the Cherokee Nation. Those, the river was the, was the dividing point between these, these two uh, Indian tribes that had been here for a long time. And so I always start here. And I, you know, it's, it's the city, it's the history of Atlanta, but I start in Buckhead because if you look down in the corner of the map where this gigantic blue arrow is, my mom you can see no, that it, there yeah. is a... Uh, okay. There's a small park there, and it's at the confluence of the Chattahoochee River and Peachtree Creek, and it's called Standing Peachtree. For tens of uh, yes, it's more to me. I live up in Ecuador. For tens of thousands of years, uh, there was an Indian village uh, at that confluence, and it was called Y'all do Standing. Every day, homeschooling. Adelaide, mm -hmm. Adelaide. What time? Yes. Tell everybody. Tell everybody to mute, please, so we're not interfering with your um, presentation. Basically, uh, I think I'll give her a lot of homework because yeah. uh, I'm her mom. So, so, <laughs> so, yeah, so, so she does a, a little bit of reading, and um, she's kind I don't of know what's going on. A lot of things. Somebody in. needs to mute. <laughs> who is it? <laughs> <laughs> if I if I turn off screen share, I can That's find out who they are. Oh, only <laughs> only one. It's okay. It's going to happen. Okay. All right. Who is it? Two thirty, three o'clock in the afternoon. I don't know who this is. Who's Burton A? For school years. I, that, I think somehow my daughter's gotten in on this. Okay. I don't is know. That who, oh, she muted. She's not here. So okay. I'm sorry. No worries. Okay. We're back online. All right. Okay. So standing Peachtree, uh, 
This was an Indian village for 10,000 years. And it's really in reality where Atlanta starts. Because in 1812, Shepard, you need to mute. In 1812, uh, there was uh, the state of Georgia, the federal government built a fort here called Fort Peachtree. And there was an important man that I, was, I want you to focus on this. His name was James Montgomery. He came to this fort and his job was to uh, build boats. And the boats would come from Gwinnett County, not the boats, but the su supplies would come from Gwinnett County down to this fort. And then he would put the supplies on boats and ship them down to Columbus, Georgia, along the Chattahoochee River. After the war, the United States abandons this fort. There's still a model of it. This is sort of Ridgewood Road in Moore's Mill, if you will. Uh, there's still a model back there. So after the war, this fort is abandoned. But James McConnell Montgomery decides that he wants to be here. So he starts writing letters and said, I'd love to cover the area, but this is in Indian territory. In 1821, the Creek signed the first treaty of Indian Springs. It gives to the United States 2 million acres for $200,000. This allows Buckhead, Atlanta, the area we know today, suddenly becomes a part of the United States and it was open for settlement. The land is divided into 202 acre lots. And that is when our friend James Montgomery returns to Atlanta. He is the first white settler. And when he comes, he brings with him his wife, Nancy. And this is the first, first couple. James Montgomery and his wife, uh, they're among the first white settlers. They purchased 1,000 acres at the Farmer Port Fort Peachtree site for $100. And this was in 1821. This is present day Ridgewood Road, Moores Mill, Marietta Boulevard, Bolton Road, 1,000 acres, so it's, it's a lot of land. They brought with them their 10 children, two of their children's spouses, at least one grandchild, his brother Hugh and his wife, their step siblings, Sally and William, another daughter, Lucinda, and her husband, Dempsey Conley. So, in all, about 20 people come to the area. Uh, that we know as, as Buckhead today. Now, Montgomery, uh, he has a number of positions. He's the only guy in the area, right? So he is the election superintendent. He is the road commissioner. He is the clerk of the court of the ordinary. He is a state senator. He is the school, the poor school commissioner, postmaster, census taker, justice of the peace, tax collector. He was a farmer. And he's best known because he operated a ferry over the Chattahoochee River in that area, which was called Montgomery's <laughs> Ferry. Mm -hmm. Now, his house was considered the one of the finest country, but the best known country houses in the state of Georgia. Because so many people traveled over the Chattahoochee River in that area, they, everyone knew him well. His wife was considered one of the noblest women in Georgia. She was a mainstay of the little Methodist church, which is still there to this day, considering the, old, the oldest church in Atlanta over on Bolton Road. Uh, she was known to make the best prayers. Uh, she was a Methodist and he was a Presbyterian, but they always got along. And interestingly, she had <laughs> only one arm, but it is said that she made good use and wielded her hoe with surprising vigor in the garden. Uh, they never uh, turned away, a, they never charged a preacher for staying at their house because their house was on the ferry route. They constantly had travelers stay with them. They never turned away the poor. They never charged a preacher. So they were these magnanimous people who were incredibly well known. Now, eventually, the Western and Atlantic Railroad will come through Montgomery's Ferry. It'll cross the Chattahoochee River, literally where Montgomery's Ferry is. And this gives me an opportunity to tell one of my favorite stories of Atlanta history. And that is of a slave named Ransom Montgomery. As you can tell from the name, Ransom was owned by Nancy and James Montgomery. He's out tending the ferry one day and in July of 1849, 
as a train is crossing that trestle, the trestle caught fire. The train stopped. And Ransom Montgomery, quick thinking, ran over, used the water from the river, put the fire out, climbed up on the trestle, and saved 100 people. His heroic act was picked up by the newspapers. It was a big deal in the state of Georgia. And for his heroic act, the state of Georgia purchased Ransom Montgomery from the Montgomery family and ensured that he lived near as free as the law would allow. He is the only slave to have ever been owned by the state of Georgia. Montgomery was given a paying job selling coffee and cakes in the rail depot. He was provided with a home. He was just the second African-American to own property in Atlanta. He was among the first elite blacks in the city. He, is, uh, he died in 1883 and is interred in historic Oakland Cemetery. Now the Montgomery family name sort of fades. There's still a Montgomery Ferry, but it's not near Montgomery Ferry Road. It's not near where Montgomery's Ferry was. It's over in Ansley Park. But you're probably more familiar with the DeFores name, DeFores Ferry, because Montgomery sells his ferry to Martin DeFore. And so Martin DeFore moves into the Montgomery house. He operates the ferry. And to this day, Montgomery DeFore Ferry Road is, is probably better known. Now, this is another couple from Atlanta history. And I, I, you know, this is not a great story. It's not a positive story by any stretch, but it is an interesting historic story. As I said, Martin and Susan DeFore lived in the Montgomery house. They were similar to the Montgomery's. They were incredibly well known. They were very well liked. Anybody who traveled on the ferry coming from Marietta or from that northern part of the state came by their house. They were well liked and well loved. And similar to the Montgomery's, their family lived all around them on all of that property. So it was a big DeFore family all around that area. But on the morning of July 26th, 1879, 73 year old Martin DeFore and his 81 year old wife Susan were found lying side by side in the first floor bedroom of their house, nearly decapitated. Oh. It was a gruesome crime. It was picked up by the New York Times. It was a huge deal. The son had come onto the property and found that his mom and dad were not awake yet, which was unusual because they were usually up at six o'clock in the morning feeding the, the animals. And he went into the house and, and found them. Um, the couple had no enemies. Uh, the search parties were sent out in all directions while word was sent to Marietta to stop any questionable travelers. Suspicion immediately fell on tramps who frequently crossed the river using the ferry. Martin DeFore had had run-ins with transients in the past, but it appeared whoever killed the DeFores knew the elderly couple. The murderer likely slipped into the house July 25th when they went to milk the cow, which they did at the same time every evening. When the DeFores went to bed that night, their murderer was upstairs. Mud was found on the bed cover and there was a human body imprint on one of the beds. Investigators also found signs of a human who had been living upstairs. All that was taken from the home were some promissory notes and a pair of boots. A sack of silver was left behind. As I said, this was a really big deal. Um, the, new, the, the crime shocked the quiet area to its core. It was so sensational that it made headlines across the, the country. Now, by this time, the terminus creating the city of Atlanta had been placed and, and Atlanta was growing eight miles down Marietta Boulevard. I don't know why it grew where it did because in the initial legislation that called for the creation of the Western and Atlantic, the Western Atlantic Railroad, <laughs> They, um, they said that the Western Atlantic Railroad would extend to the southern bank of the Chattahoochee River. Now, eight sites were selected for this crossing, and the site that was selection, selected was Montgomery's Ferry. Now, remember, the terminus was to be on the bank of the river at Montgomery's Ferry. So technically, downtown Atlanta should be right there on Ridgewood Road, 
uh, the confluence of the Chattahoochee River and Peachtree Creek. And how wild would Atlanta be if it was on the Chattahoochee River? I've always wondered why we kind of turned our back uh, to the river over time. Eventually, Atlanta grows back to the north. It comes back to Buckhead after Atlanta develops its downtown and becomes this bustling city. Uh, people move back to Buckhead. It, but why? What, what happened that caused many prominent families to come back to the area? Well, in order to tell that story, we're going to talk about James Whispering Smith. This is Harmony Grove Cemetery. It's on the corner of West Paces Ferry and Chatham. Uh, Buckhead Heritage is, is, was really the group that adopted the cemetery and claimed it up. A lot of people didn't know it was there for many, many years. Uh, this obelisk here is the gravesite of James Whispering Smith. He is a very important early Buckhead pioneer settler. He owned all the property, about 400 acres, that included the present day governor's mansion, all of Arden Road, uh, just a substantial amount of real estate in that area. When he dies in 1872, he actually donates two acres to the black community for use as a church and as a school. And that two acres is New Hope AME on Arden Road, which is still there to this day. A gentleman named James Dickey, a businessman from Atlanta, buys James Whispering Smith's 400 acres in 1903 when James Smith's widow dies. And this ends up creating the buckhead that we know today. I think he paid uh, about $6,000 for the 400 acres in 1903. <clears throat> he sells uh, 70 plus acres to his good friend, Robert Maddox. Robert Maddox, former uh, Atlanta mayor. He was a prominent banker, very well-known well known and well-liked individual. Well, Robert Maddox builds Woodhaven on what was then Peachtree Trail. It's now West Paces Ferry Road. Where Woodhaven is today is uh, the governor's mansion. Well, Woodhaven, just like the sun at the center of a spiraling galaxy, ends up drawing a lot of prominent Atlantans to the area. Uh, it ends up all those houses that come along uh, uh, West Paces Ferry there, I consider it kind of an arms race. They all build up these houses to, to compete with one another to see who could build the biggest and best house. One of those houses is Villa Lamar. This is kind of a, one of those funny stories about how the, the man's name ends up on the house when it's really the, woman's, uh, uh, who, the woman who did the house. Uh, Villa Lamar is named for William Bailey Lamar. William Bailey Lamar was a, a Floridian. He was the attorney general of the state of Georgia, a state of Florida. He was a congressman and uh, he married a woman, an Atlantan named Ethel Toy Healy. It was actually Ethel who acquired the land uh, that Villa Lamar sits on. Now, if you guys don't know Villa Lamar, this is Judy and Ed Garland's house. Uh, it's on West Paces Ferry. You can't really see it from the street, but it is a magnificent house. 1911, yep. it's the oldest of the original Buckhead uh, uh, mansions, if you will. Uh, it had a ton of real estate. By the time they built the house, Ethel had acquired 200 acres. So it had a, just a huge piece of property. I think it went all the way back to practically Chastain Park. Um, but because Ethel Toy Healy was married to William Bailey Lamar, it was known as Villa Lamar. They didn't call it that. Uh, it was known by a couple of different names. Uh, Hollywood, Newcastle, but for whatever reason, it was called Villa Lamar. A funny story too, uh, William Bailey Lamar and Ethel never lived in the house. It, they finished it and they moved to Washington immediately. So it was one of those things, no one, they didn't live there. Uh, another one of the, probably the most famous of those houses is uh, Tribe Vessen. It's still there. Uh, this was the house of Andrew Calhoun. Uh, it's on Pine Street today. Uh, what I would give to be able to see this house when it, fa when it faced uh, West Paces Ferry and had this magnificent lawn in front of it. Um, the reason that I brought this house in is another one of those couple stories. Uh, Andrew Calhoun's wife, uh, Mary Whoa. Guy Calhoun founded the first garden club in Atlanta, the Peachtree Garden Club in 1923. 
And the first meeting of the Peachtree Garden Club was in that, this house. Right, here's another, another house. Uh, this is one that has a family connection, obviously. Uh, my first name is Albert. Uh, it should not be called the Albert E. Thornton House. Uh, this is a house that uh, was designed by Philip Schutze. Uh, Schutze also did the um, Tregvesson as well. So the story of this house is that uh, Albert and Edna Thornton, this was my great aunt and uncle, lived with the, Albert Thornton's mother, Leela Thornton, in downtown Atlanta. And Edna had her own money and she wanted a house. She did not like living under uh, Albert's mother's roof. So one day she went to Albert and she said, I've, I've got some money and I think we need to build our own house. And Albert said, well, why would we do that? We've got this great house with mother upstairs. <laughs> and Aunt Edna looked at him and said, uh, well, that's fine. You stay here with your mother. I'm going to go build a house. So Edna built this house. Uh, it should be the Edna McCandless Thornton house, not the Albert E. Thornton house, because he was dragged kicking and screaming into it. Uh, Aunt Edna had some legendary conflicts with uh, Schutze over the house. If you've ever been by there, it's not on the center of the lot. The Grant house was next door to it. Uh, it's way <clears throat> over to the uh, left-hand <laughs> side. And uh, Schutze did not like that, but... Aunt Edna, being a shrewd woman, uh, wanted to be able to hold on to one of the lots in case she needed to sell it. And that's why that house is where it is. A little bit further down is the most famous house in Atlanta, the, the Swan House. The Swan House uh, was built for Edward and Emily Inman. Emily and Edward Inman, excuse me. Um, the reason I bring this house in is because it allows me to introduce Emily and Edward Inman's niece, Louise Richardson. Now, Louise Richardson, uh, the, the Richardson family, if, if I had a, a photo of their house, I, I, I always push Hugh Richardson on this to give me a picture of Broadlands, but they have a magnificent house that's on Northside. It's one of the great Atlanta homes. Uh, it's one of the, but it's also one that there are not a lot of photos of. You don't, you know, if you go on Google or into the search sites, you don't, you don't find a lot of them. But that house is the house uh, that the, the Richardsons had. Um, this is Louise and Ivan Allen. Uh, Louise Richardson was uh, a force of nature in her in her own right. Uh, in fact, she was uh, presented at the. Um, court of uh, St. James to Queen Mary and Edward Prince of Wales in 1935. Uh, she marries Ivan Allen. Ivan Allen is a scion of Atlanta business. His father was a state senator, had his office supply company. Ivan Allen came into that company and grew it uh, leaps and bounds. Uh, but Ivan Allen really comes into his own as the uh, president of the Atlanta Chamber of Commerce when he maps out a route for the future of Atlanta. And uh, he be, you know, sells this idea of Atlanta as an international city. Uh, and he eventually becomes the mayor of Atlanta. Uh, his, you know, his dad had been a state senator, so their politics was in their blood. Uh, and Ivan Allen is mayor of Atlanta during the civil rights movement. I mean, it's just the, the, the most tumultuous time in the South uh, for a white mayor to manage a city like Atlanta that is really the birthplace of the civil rights movement. Remarkably, one of the first things he does when he gets into office is he has all the segregated signs pulled down. He doesn't want separate bathrooms. He doesn't want separate water fountains. He just take, takes them all down immediately. Uh, he has a couple of miscues, but generally he manages it better than most. He was mayor during the Orly plane crash and he flew to Paris to comfort the families. Uh, he was mayor during uh, Martin Luther King. He was mayor when Martin Luther King was given the Nobel Peace Prize and arranged to have him properly feted by city leaders. But he was also mayor uh, when Martin Luther King was, was assassinated. And uh, he went to Memphis and, and, his, and Louise Allen ends up being one of the people that comforts Coretta Scott King as she deals with the, with the death of her, of her husband. Um, Louise Allen was a, was, a, was a force in and of herself. Uh, 
she was involved in so many different things, but the one I want to talk about goes back to that house, the Swan House, which, as I said, had belonged to her aunt and uncle, had been built for her aunt and uncle, because she's involved with the Atlanta Historical Society. The Atlanta Historical Society had been down on Peachtree, and she's the one that makes the recommendation that the Atlanta Historical Society uh, buys this house and makes it a historic house for, for Atlanta. Um, they do that and the Atlanta Historical Society ends up taking over that kind of corner of West Paces Ferry, Slayton and, and Andrews. She's also instrumental in raising the money for the Atlanta History Center Museum. Uh, and she's, you know, one of the things that I don't think many people appreciate about the Atlanta History Center are the gardens. It's 33 acres of some of the most beautiful walking trails in Atlanta. And, and there are so many magnificent little gardens everywhere you turn when you go walk the property. It's just, there are lots of little treats, as I say. Uh, and that is a direct result of Louise Allen getting her friends garden clubs to come in and to adopt different sections of that campus to beautify it and to make it native plants. All of the things that you see there um, are, are mostly her work and how she contributed uh, to, that, to that campus. Bringing us into contemporary time, another couple that I wanted to, to talk about uh, and, and their contributions to Atlanta can't be overstated. Uh, is Elena, Alana and Harold Shepard. Uh, obviously this was a tragedy. Uh, their son in 1973 was injured in a, uh, a, a, a dove into a wave and, and suffered a spinal injury. And uh, Harold Shepard, successful construction, had a, Sh a Shepard construction company. Uh, he and his brother built a lot of the roads in Georgia, built roads all over the country. Uh, but as they dealt with their son's injury, they found that there was not any thing, any place in Atlanta uh, to provide care for their son. So they had to find the, the, the right hospital, the right rehabilitation center somewhere else. And instead of just accepting that and uh, uh, you know, dealing with that, they turned their attention to building a rehabilitation center in Atlanta. And what happened from that point forward as of 1976 is that the Shepherd Center has become one of the world's great rehabilitation centers. If you have a spinal injury, if you have a brain injury, the Shepherd Center is where you go to receive treatment. Soldiers injured in combat come to Atlanta to rehab at the Shepherd Center. It is one of the uh, great contributions not just to the city of Atlanta, but to the, the country to have this place right here in, in Atlanta, uh, all through the sheer will really of the, of the Shepherd family. Uh, we lost Harold Shepherd uh, three years ago, uh, but Alana is still at the center as far as I know. I mean, you walk in the door and she's there to greet just about everybody and it's her life's work. They really have contributed a tremendous amount. I often, you know, look at folks like my grandparents. My grandparents uh, were one of those couples, I guess you could say, that were influential and important in Atlanta. My grandmother chaired the first Piedmont Ball for Piedmont Hospital. My grandfather was the chairman of the Atlanta Music Festival Association, which brought the Metropolitan mm -hmm. Opera to Atlanta from the 1930s, 40s, up until the time they stopped touring in the 1980s. Um, these were folks that uh, had had some success in business, but also gave a lot back to the community. Uh, another couple that I mentioned in my column this week, or so one of my great friends, Jimmy Cushman, uh, his grandparents, uh, the Alstons, just, you know, Mr. Alston was one of the founding partners of the firm that became Alston Bird. He served as the ambassador to Australia under Jimmy Carter. Uh, and then Mrs. Alston, really was the moving force behind the beginnings of the Atlanta Botanical Garden and helped transform this hilltop in Piedmont Park, which had been kind of seedy, was where all the hippies hung out into arguably one of the great botanical gardens in the country, if not the world. Uh, I often look at Atlanta and I think 
who's who's next? Who's gonna who's gonna step up and who's going to be these next couples that contribute so well to the, the future of Atlanta? And all I can remember is is that you know history happens as we're in it. We don't know who these people are. I don't. I imagine the Allens knew uh, uh, that they were making a big difference in the world. But through the prism of time, we really get a sense of the, uh, the accomplishments and we develop an appreciation of what they contributed. And so with that, um, I'll close it up and take any questions you guys have. Gordon, that was fantastic. Just exactly, exactly what we wanted to hear. And thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, I, I had actually um, a question. You sort of gave, didn't tell us a lot more about your family. I'd like to hear a little bit more about your parents. Oh Would gosh. You know, just a little <laughs> bit. Uh, so uh, I, I think my, you know, my mom and dad, Alfred Kennedy, uh, ran the Atlanta Opera for, gosh, what, 20 years. I mean, he and Boise were thick as thieves in that endeavor. Um, so you know, that, but that really grew out of my mom and papa, my grandparents' contributions uh, in terms of the Atlanta Music Festival Association and really that connection with the Metropolitan Opera and bringing the Met here. As all you guys know, I mean, you guys know more Atlanta history than I, I can possibly even begin to shake at. Uh, the Met was a really big deal. That, that, that party was kind of the, the, the one week when the Met came was, was a big deal in Atlanta history. Uh, my grandmother was from Thomaston, Georgia. Uh, she came here because uh, she didn't want to be in Thomaston, Georgia anymore. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, you know, his, that family goes back to the Austells uh, and the Thorntons, sort of the early, Alfred Austell owned railroads, the bank. He uh, it was one of the founders of what would become Wachovia Bank. But then on my mom's side, uh, those were the Adairs and the Howells. Uh, in fact, my great grandmother, <clears throat> Queenie Howell, built the house across from the governor's mansion, which has the nestled down label on it. And it's known as the, the Mrs. George Arthur Howell house. Uh, and so Ma Ma, my grandmother uh, married a fellow named Buster Bird. And he's the other side of that Alston Bird. So uh, Paul Paul was, you know, his firm merged with Philip Alston's firm to form uh, uh, Austin, Austin Bird. So it's fascinating, I guess. It, it is to me. It, I'm a blow-in. Not being from Atlanta, I love hearing about all of, <clears throat> all of the history. So thank you. Are, does anyone else have questions? One quick one where he, you showed the um, where Montgomery was buried. Yes. And I remember years ago having we we lived on the end of West Wesley and Ridgewood, so that yeah that whole territory was kind of familiar. Is that on the hill? It's it's kind of high up on Marietta Boulevard. Where is that? Exactly. Okay. okay. So if you where that new Publix has been built on okay, Marietta, I wondered. What, I hadn't been over there in a long time. What was next to it now? If you go across the street, there's like a pizza place. It's uh -huh. completely covered in ivy. Uh, there's a chain link fence with razor wire on top of it that, that holds the Montgomery family cemetery. And in my opinion, there are not many more important historic sites in Atlanta than the you know, family cemetery of one of the first settlers to you know, live in this area. Uh, it, it, there's a historic marker, but it's way back up in the hill and it's covered in ivy. Uh, so yeah, I'm trying. I don't understand that because we hadn't been there in like 45 years. We just happened on it. I mean, it, no. it, it's really, it's probably even neglected at this point. <clears throat> it, it, it is. And trees have fallen and taken the, the, the fence down and you have uh, just a lot. But the, but the problem is, is the Montgomery family still around no. and they, it's their cemetery. So it, all, mm -hmm. as much as we're trying to get historic preservation groups involved, it's really hard if someone came to me and said, hey, we'd like to take over the Austell Mausoleum. I'd say no, <laughs> <laughs> thanks, but no thanks. So um, I, I hope that someday we can work out something to where we can properly restore it and tell the story of the Montgomery family and the divorce. So in, in my slideshow, I skipped over that because I'm ADD. 
but the DeFores, uh, Susan and Martin DeFore are also in that cemetery. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank well, you. Thornton, can you, am I unmuted? Thornton, can you hear I me? I can hear you. Okay. Well, the, what I've always, growing up when I was in E Rivers in high school, we always called it the Pink Palace, the Andrew Calhoun House. Is that correct? It, you could see it beautifully. And the one of the owners, I think, was killed in the parish plane crash. Isn't that right? Oh, I, I, I think that's correct. And the bank trust department sold off the front yard oh, you know, to, for lots. But you, at least you can still drive down and see the house. Shepard, you've given me a new column. Okay. <laughs> uh, it, was, it was definitely called the Pink Palace, and that is because uh, Schutze had a way to patina the front of the house to make it look yeah. faded, as if it had yes. been out in the Italian sun for 100 years. Um, is, is, so that had not, this... is that not Josephine Robinson's no. house? No. no. One's called the Pink Castle, and the other's called the Pink Palace. Oh. Okay. <laughs> so I, <laughs> which well, one is nice. which? Well, it's nice that Josephine Robinson's house seemed to have survived that everybody thought it was going to be uh, damaged very much. It looks like you can still see it very well there at the corner of well, the Tuxedo the, and West Paces. The challenge with that house is that um, they, the, the, the front yard is subdivided. So yeah. you could technically build a house in the front yard of yeah. Mrs. Robinson's house. And so that's what mm -hmm. we're all with that, with that row of shrubs that's gone up across yeah. there. We're all constantly looking through the shrubs to see if the stakes have gone in the yard. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, because my understanding was that it was a stretch for the fellow that bought the house to, to acquire it. And one of the ways he was gonna pay for it was by subdividing the lots up. And I think the neighborhood just lost its mind and he backed off, thankfully. Yeah. Well, the, the, the Pink Palace is, the, the Pink Palace is the Calhoun house, isn't that right? I don't, you know, I always mess it yeah, up. I, I can I mess barely it up keep too. my own kid's name straight, so. Yeah, okay. <laughs> anyway, it's beautiful. Thank you. Hmm. Well, all right, guys, thank you for having me. Oh, thank, thank you, Thank you so much. Everybody <laughs> is just thrilled to have you. Thank you so much. All right, much. guys, thanks, okay, take thank care. You, thank you, Thornton. Thank you, It was great, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hmm. Wow, it was great. Um, things I thought we would talk about since we haven't actually been together in almost a year um, and that is what's coming up um, there are several things that we have to do or generally are expected to do for the month of February announce the topics um, announce um, let me make sure I make sure I've got my list right um, announce the subject areas and who are going to be our presenters and hostesses and then also the number of vacancies and who might or might not be eligible for honorary. Um, I wanted to say one thing, I talked with Becky earlier and what we'd like to do since we haven't had a meeting in a home, nobody's been a hostess since last April, um, would you all consider this? It's a little off the way we usually do things, but this year's 2021 hostesses lost that opportunity to be a hostess. So what I'd like to do is just take that group of women and just put them into next year. The presenters, we have been rolling along pretty well. And I think we'll have everybody done by the end of the year as if we were, as, as if we had had a normal year. Are you all all right with that? Yeah. Does anybody want to weigh in on that? I, I just feel like if we skip, I, I, we're going to get the whoever was supposed to be hostess in April and May, I think Virginia, you might've been one of them. We're just gonna give them a bye and, and just give the 2021 hostesses 21, 22 year. Is that okay with everyone? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. does, that, so, does that mesh with the presenters also? Is anyone gonna have to do double duty next year? Is well, that's what that? we've got to work out. We'll, we'll make sure that won't happen for sure. Um, it's not that big a deal if it happens, just so long as it's not the same day. <laughs> I'd like it not to happen, but I think Carolyn McClatchy told me once she was president, had to be a hostess, and you had to do a paper. Isn't that right, Carolyn? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so Bye. let's hope that doesn't befall me. But anyway, um, Becky's okay with that, and so I think we're going to do it that way. Um, if, if you have any questions or concerns, let me know. Um, I'll also want to let you know that we are 
I'm going to have Betsy Verner talk about Nicholas and Alexandra in the month of February. And Betsy, um, I'll, we'll talk separately about whether or not you want to do it via Zoom now that we've sort of are beginning to figure it out or do with the YouTube. There, there are pros and cons both ways. Um, I like the YouTube because you can do it whenever you want to do it and watch it whenever you want. Um, but we'll talk about that and I'll, I'll be letting you know probably via email. Um, let's see, what else did I want to say? Oh, thanks again for everyone who sent your um, dues in. I think I mentioned that in my last letter. Um, we have lots of money now, so I'm hopeful that when <clears throat> all this is over, we can have a party and hug each other and all those other things. So let's hope we can, we can do that soon because um, we haven't had any expenses this year. Um, let's see, was, is there anything else, Becky, did I miss something that we wanted to talk about? Are you still on? She might be. Gone. Hey, I am. I'm in the carpool line picking up a child. So okay. That's, oh, that's, that's right. Sorry. Right. But no, I think you, I think you're right. And I am um, very much looking forward to hugging everyone and seeing people in person, but, um, I think you've got it all. Okay, well, and if anybody would like to, because I'm, I'm really thinking about the historical aspect of this nice little group in four or five decades hence, what they would be thinking of us, probably laughing at, at my inept ability to handle Zoom, but um, would anybody like to share what you've been doing for the last 10 months? I mean, <laughs> just for posterity's sake, I know, Virginia, you've been very, very busy and productive. I, I have not. I don't have a lot to, to say. Other what than I have him. been doing is puzzles. <laughs> I mean, who has a use for their dining room table nowadays, right? <laughs> so our table is covered with always, sometimes one that we work on together, sometimes two. Sometimes Bond has one on one end of the table and I have one on the other. Um, but puzzles keep your mind going. You, it's, it's a fascinating way to spend time. So what I have found are the wooden puzzles are really, really fascinating. Liberty is the name of the um, company out of Colorado, but you have to get on their waiting list, go online, and it takes 55 days for you to get in line to order one. I ordered my first direct Liberty yesterday. So I would recommend that. Uh, there's also one, oh, I always have trouble. I'll think of it in a minute that you can order, but whether it's cardboard or wooden, puzzles are fascinating. So that's what I've been doing. Well, I could recommend um, a book about history. Um, I'm, I've just finished reading and given a book review on the first half of a 600 page book by Rick Atkinson called The British Are Coming. And it's our American history and we know it's so, it's so familiar to us, but there's a lot of fascinating detail in there that we've uh, we probably missed along the way. I recommend that. That'll keep you busy for a while <laughs> if you're looking for something to do. It's The British Are Coming by Rick Atkinson. Fantastic. Fabulous. Anybody else? Well, one thing I had fun doing this summer at Canterbury, I'm part of the flower arrangement committee and we try to put something pretty out in the front hall every week. Well, when the COVID shut us all down, we couldn't go out shopping, but we didn't need to. We used the beautiful flowers in our back garden. First, there were the daffodils, and then we had some tulips and some peonies and daisies and azaleas along there in the spring. And then we had some zinnias uh, that somebody planted for us this summer. So we had flowers all summer and that was kind of fun. It was a challenge and, um, and it was fun, along with reading and that sort of thing. Sounds great. Anybody else? They're gonna to wanna to know what we did with our time. And yeah, Margaret? I, I have a new grandbaby. That's my exciting news. My Yay. daughter what? November, a little girl. Uh, Mother, so you're a grandmother. You're the best looking grandmother I've ever seen. <laughs> oh, Margaret, wow. what, what's her name, Margaret? Her name Tell is Margaret. Name. Her name is Margaret Boyd. She's named for my mother. Oh, 
that's that's a great name. And you're calling her <laughs> live in Connecticut. Yeah. <laughs> Bummer. Have you gotten to see her? Yes, we went up there when she was born and stayed, you know, about a, a, we stayed a little bit before she came and then a little while after. And then they came down, they drove down with their dog for Christmas, which a German shepherd, a one-year-old German shepherd and a baby. It was the road trip from hell, <laughs> but they were down for about two weeks over the holidays. Oh, how wonderful. It wonderful. was great. Well, I, I guess speaking of grandchildren, my four oldest grandchildren of the eight or granddaughters, they're all at the University of North Carolina and have all been at home taking classes from afar. So their experience of college is not very exciting yet. No. Yeah. Yeah. Really been really good just hard. awful. Um, let me ask you all one thing. Um, do you think, and I really would love a your opinions. Do you think we are not going to be able to meet until next fall? I, mean, I do not. Yes. Okay. No. Everybody go get their vaccine, the vaccination. Yeah, well. That would help. <laughs> right. But you think just not even try to think about anything. I wouldn't even I wouldn't even try that. because we meet the first of May. And they're saying that everybody won't get vaccinated until for sure until the end of the summer or midsummer. Right, um, right. Even though we're all in, in a group that would probably be done by June, but that that's not by May. No, no. Okay. Well, I have been spectacularly wrong, haven't I? And just thinking, oh yeah, we're gonna meet in a couple of months and it just <laughs> never happened. So gosh, I'm glad I didn't have money on that decision. Um mm -hmm. is anybody else wanna share what you've been doing? I, I have <laughs> something busy. I want to have, I have something I want to ask you all. It kind of has to do with our program. Um, did, did Florida Ellis wasn't here today, but her mother was Laura Smith. Yeah. Didn't, wasn't, wasn't, um, weren't they, wasn't Woodhaven their family home? Yeah, it was her, her, her father. That's what I thought. That's what I thought. After he finished, It wouldn't be Florida's grandfather. Florida's here. Florida, 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 you're muted. Yeah. Florida, unmute. Yeah. Oh, okay. Unmute. Mother was born at home in the house known huh? as Woodhaven, the Tudor house that was there before the governor's mansion. Uh huh. And they cut the road through from West Faces Ferry to Tuxedo, Woodhaven Road. Um, and my grandfather cited the house that mother and daddy built in 1940. And she lived there until she died at home in 2009. She lived 69 years, um, essentially on the same land. And she was born at home and died at home oh. within a quarter of a mile. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, but our activity this year, uh, uh, I feel like, you know, well, anyway, we have moved. So we're now at Peachtree Hills Place. And Westminster now owns our house on Nancy Creek. What, what are they, they do? doing with the house, Florida? I think they'll rent it. They rent the house on the corner and they own several of the houses. Um, their board has the policy of trying to own the perimeter. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not going to be crazy about it. So if somebody's holding out for way too much money, they'll just, they'll, they'll let them keep it. But mm -hmm. in general, they're, policy is to own their perimeter, which is really a smart thing because our land used to be part of the summer camp. That camp. Or Fritz Orr sold, when he sold property to Westminster, he gave our lot and the one on the corner to two oh. of his daughters. So it did not go to Westminster, but it was originally part of the camp property. There was a gymnasium on our land that burned in the early 60s and then we bought the lot in 1966 and moved in in 1969 so we were there 51 years plus a little it's wonderful wonderful jane are you i know you've been busy uh you're muted Un unmute 
Um, yeah, you go. I, I feel like, no, I haven't been that busy. My husband's been very busy. He, he, so right now we're um, sort of uh, quarantining ourselves because everybody seems to be getting sick. So he's been working from home. So he's basically on Zooms from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. every single day, which you can imagine that's, it's pretty overwhelming. Um, uh, but, and then my kids have been kind of in and out. Audrey just started a master's program at Columbia University, but she's doing it from here. So it's kind of interesting because when she does her Zoom classes, there's people from all over the world doing these Zoom classes from like a little island off the coast of West Africa to China. So, um, and then Clayton just left today to go back up to UVA. Um, and uh, yeah, so we're, we're hanging in there, so. Crazy. Well, I've been doing, it's funny, everybody's at home and they're looking around and thinking, I need to recover that sofa. So <laughs> I have been so busy for people who are, so tired of their environment and they just want a little freshening up so it's funny how this whole pandemic thing has affected some industries and in some industries it's made busier and some it's laid flat so it's it's funny how how that goes but i think people are dying to get out and um hopefully that'll be soon well in july um my husband's been working with somebody and they're going to start a cheese store so then, so when we all can get out in July, we can all meet there and they'll, they'll have an outdoor patio. You can have cheese and, and wine and all that kind of stuff. That's great. <laughs> it's well, that uh, it's going to be down on Armour Circle um, and it's in a building where on one side, there's a coffee shop right now called East mm -hmm. Pole mm -hmm. and then they'll be on the other side. So mm -hmm. they'll have, you know, charcuterie boards and they have a, Pretty famous right. cheese monger coming to run the place, so it'll be fun. That's that sounds fantastic. What's the name of it? Do they have a name yet? Yep, Audrey came up with the name. The name is called uh, Capella Cheese. Fantastic, mm. great. Yeah. How do you say it? Capella Cheese? Capella Cheese. Mm. So. Okay, well, listen, why, why don't we? wrap this up i've had this recorded and if i'm if my information is correct for anyone who missed it for whatever reason or you want to pick back up and watch thornton's speech i think it's going to be recorded and can be looked at or viewed for i think 30 days um i think that's just, i think that's a setup i'll i'll check more into that so if you'd like to go back and look at it um i would like to hear from those of you who have an opinion whether you want to do Zoom next month with Betsy, or do you want just to hear, uh, see her YouTube? Um, we've also want to fold back in Ann Nam Noon, who wasn't able to do her paper last fall, but is ready now. So we may have two papers in February, um, and I'll just sort of schedule that with people as I can. Um, does anybody have any thoughts on that, or do you just want to think about it and let me know if you do? No? I think we can just we'll just email you that'd be great that'd, that'd, be, like great. that'd be great okay well um i would like to adjourn for the tea but um <laughs> i'm sorry we can't and oh 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 i almost forgot cute jane emailed me yesterday she said should i just take cookies to everybody for the meeting and and i thought about the logistics of that and i i happily said no don't no bother don't worry but thank you jane for the very sweet thought that, well, that we, we ended up not getting back to atlanta till about 11 o'clock last night so I'm well then that was a close <laughs> call then wasn't <laughs> it <laughs> well thank you everybody and everybody <laughs> looks great thank you thank you Adam. Bye. Bye. good job bye. thank you bye 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 thank you hold on